It don't matter what I try I just can't win and I don't know why There's a fork in every road I pick the wrong one and then I go American loser, yes I am Disenfranchised from everything well, I fall up and I fall down An American loser the day I was born Welcome back to another edition of American Loser, guys. Uh, Larry has abandoned us. Lawrence Patrick is uh, he's gone, guys. He's, he's left the show. He stormed out. He said uh, he found me stifling creatively. And uh, I was never really his kid anyway. Hard way to find out. You Damn. know what I mean? I'm kidding, actually. He's camping somewhere in uh, western New Jersey because you can't leave the state, but you can go camping within it. You know damn well everything you just said was in fact true as well. A- <laughs> You're just trying to cope with the camping. I am adopted. That's why I'm uh, about uh, six inches shorter than him, and I can't grow facial hair. We found that out the hard way, too. But yeah, uh, he's got uh, a way more epic mustache. It's unfortunate, man. But behind the ones and twos, who else could it be other than the Big Kahuna? How are you doing, buddy? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm very excited. Now, I forgot that you don't know our guest today because uh, Ming was uh, our audio engineer for uh, for this gentleman's uh, debut episode, which as of right now, by the way, the most listened to episode of American Loser. Is it really? Yeah, about Edward Bernays, one of the uh, fascinating episodes. So uh, Andy Lawson, a.k.a. Andy High Roller, a.k.a. Andy Hot Boy. How are you doing, bud? Hey, everybody. How are you? <laughs> Welcome back to the show, handsome. Yeah. I mean, that sucks about your dad, but at this point in your life, you're probably used to the rejection, so, right? That's, <laughs> yeah. I told you, somebody mentioned to me uh, uh, not too long ago, they're like, oh, it's uh, it's your second dad, right? And I was like, that means I have twice as many dads as you. you know? <laughs> the guy didn't like that at all. But no, uh, if you guys are listening to uh, the show regularly, you know what we do here on American Loser. We put the spotlight firmly on second place. And if you don't know what we do here, welcome to a podcast that explores the biggest losers in American history. Uh, we got a damn good one here for you. I'm excited about this. My handsome Dilf of a dad is not here today at a shared universe studio in uh, Eatontown, New Jersey. We miss you, Pop. Yeah, Mike and Ming taking good care of us, though. Uh, my buddy Nick Bueller, by the way, hooked us up with steak and macaroni salad, of which I think um, I need someone else to eat that shit, guys. I'm not going to... It's not going well for me, all right? I'm losing a lot of weight, but that was... That was essentially trying to travel with a porn star on your way to uh, a sex ed sermon of some sort. <laughs> now, this, this quarantine's been rough on me. I had two abs at the beginning, and now I have zero. <laughs> so. uh, no, it is cool that way, man. Uh, we are drinking Ross IPA, the Navasink, uh, with ruby red grapefruit. It's good shit, man. That's a, is it a thumbs up at least out of you, Andy? Yeah, it's good. It's good. It has like um, a settling effect on your stomach, too, as opposed to some uh, IPAs, which are very acidic. That's the truth, man. Yeah. I like that one a lot. We were uh, drinking those heavy uh, at his, this thing in Brooklyn we did for work. And that's my favorite part of that job is you get to get drunk on the clock and it's mm. encouraged. So <laughs> thank you very much to Both the good of people at Ross. jobs, you get to get drunk on the clock. Yeah. And it's no wonder I've developed a problem. Hmm. So. Well. <laughs> Uh, today's loser actually, uh, had some interesting moves with booze throughout his life. Did he not? He did. Yeah. Now here's the problem with this guy being an American loser. He's arguably in first place in a lot of categories. <laughs> uh, here's the thing about this show though, man, that happens a lot more than you realize. <laughs> like you'll like, there'll be You're winners, right. and, yeah. there'll be winners in a lot of different categories, but then you start to delve into it and you're just like, Oh no, no, stop it with the stupidity. Please. No, please stop. It gets worse and worse. Coon is innocent because he doesn't know the topic just yet. Is okay. also uh, which which I love. Um, is is that there's the idea that you could be a good person if you just didn't do these ones. But this dude today, let's just say the name by the way. Carl Panzram. Yeah, uh, one of a, a prolific serial killer and rapist. He's and a prolific rapist. Johnny Sodomy might as well have been his nickname. <laughs> all right. Yeah, uh, he claims to have uh, have over twelve hundred victims. It's uh, I'll ask this. We'll, we'll start with a question if we can do that okay. one. So you and me talk a lot, pop culture stuff. Sure. Kahuna, diehard film fan. Uh, we can both agree, I would say, guys, that the three of us would agree that you, it's important to have a good opening line in a movie or a book, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so book, one of the, the first lines that pops in my head, it, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, right? Okay. okay. Uh, think of a book one, two, while we're doing this, if you want okay. to throw an example. Kahuna, you got one off the top of your head? I'm trying to think. Opening line from a book? Mm. How about Moby Dick? Call me Ishmael. <laughs> you know, 
Oh, I got one for a movie. Hit me with a movie one. Case of plutonium stolen from uh, from local <laughs> nationalists or whatever. Back to the future, people. Solid on that one. Uh, mine would be Goodfellas. Uh, ever, as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Right? Oh. Yeah, I'm going to draw a blank on the first line of a movie. Like, uh, trailer-wise, I would say I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Ooh, Fight Club. Fight Club, yeah. Solid. So we understand the power of an opening line, right? Because I'm going to give you Carl Panzram's autobiography opening line, and I think it sets the tone for the entire episode. Okay. You guys ready? Yeah. In my lifetime, I have murdered 21 human beings. I have committed thousands of burglaries, robberies, larcenies, and arsons. And last but not least, I have committed sodomy on more than 1,000 male human beings. For all these things, I am not the least bit sorry. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. You think you're going to hear this guy out once he opens with a line like that? I take back all I said in the beginning. Imagine imagine how uh, packed his schedule was, though. Because I don't think I could get that done. And he was only around. He wasn't around for a long time. No, did not live to be an old man. He was like, yeah, I mean, he was busy. Because he was caught or because... Well, we got to. Uh, yeah, here, I mean, here's what's the fun. end of the story. Isn't yeah, it? I'll give away. We'll do. Um, Let's do Pulp Fiction in this bitch. We'll oh, Tarantino okay. some of this shit. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But I will say this. Um, welcome to uh, uh, Carl Panzram, American Loser. As uh, as my good friend uh, Andy, you did due diligence, man. This is what I love about this guy too. Shows up with notes. Guests who show up with notes are the better guests. Extra I, points in the in the American Loser book. Exactly. Um, but, I got into this guy about five years ago. There was one documentary on Netflix, and then I tried to follow up on the internet, and there was like a lack of information. So I think that the possibility that the Netflix documentary spurred podcasts and websites and stuff like that over time, because definitely this time around, getting into it, there's more than you can digest. Well, I, f- I think we watched the same documentary too, because it was uh, it had some, it was good high production quality uh, on the stuff, and a lot of it was told. Because the guy did write his own autobiography, and you, you know, we made some good comments about uh, the potential, um, the what was the commercial value of this? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, we get into where it winds up going. But here's this: the first thing, just a, a brief perusal of this guy, and we, we had to do this episode because there's a Jersey connection, right? Shockingly enough, and then there's also a there's multiple loser receptions, but one huge one in particular that was interesting. But um, I think we both watched that same documentary. This guy, it, you can be born bad. I think that's going to be, uh, you know, something we're just going to have to accept on this one. Mm-hmm. Born in uh, 1891 to a nice German family out in Minnesota, which uh, I feel like we keep accidentally landing on, like, the polite Midwestern people. There's some dark shit going on out there, too. Well, when you yeah. don't have a beach, it, it kind of fucks <laughs> with your head. Like, come on. Now, the word panzer in German also means, um, like, armor or tank. So there is a possibility that his last name, like, given his size, may have been, like, a uh, ancestral thing. Like, oh, he's big. He's a panzer, a panzram. And it may have turned into that. Ooh. Well, yeah. we will discuss his physical characteristics in a yeah. second, too, because uh, this guy was um, – the title of this one I was actually going with, and we'll, we'll break it in later because you gave me a cool angle for this. Carl Panzram, a.k.a. G.G. Allen without a guitar. <laughs> um, but uh, nice German family out in Minnesota. Carl is bad news pretty early on as a kid, all right? Uh, Carl claims to have always felt odd as a child. Um, I couldn't verify this, but there's something that happened to him uh, where he had, like, an ear infection of some sort. And they had to do a surgery, and they I think they removed part of his inner ear. And I think that made him irritable his whole life. I could not verify that. Oh, I so. get it. Irritable. <laughs> if you're, um, if you know something about that, message me. You can hit us up at American Loser Podcast on Instagram, American Loser Podcast on Facebook, or just KP Burke on anything. Find me and let me know about that. But um, his rap sheet pretty much corroborates that he's going to be odd as a kid. Criminal career starts out at age. What, what age do you want to guess? He starts really fucking around with some of the some bad behaviors. Eight. Ooh. Ooh. I don't know why. I, I just feel like if, if for this guy in particular, it started really young. You were correct, but it started at age five and six. What? Yeah. What was he killing cats or whatever? No, uh, he was lying and uh, and displaying some uh, aggressive type behaviors early on, though. Mm. So. See, I read that he had an abusive alcoholic father. Very much so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You said a nice German family. I mean, a minute sarcastically. Ago. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, uh, parents, super strict. 
Uh, dad's a bit of a drunk. Uh, drunks always leave uh, booze around the house. And uh, he gets started with, uh, per Carl's own words, by the way, uh, he only got meaner the older he got. So every year he lived on this planet, he got meaner. Um, Our guy or his dad? Carl Panzram okay. or himself, yeah. So, uh, and then by age eight, he is, uh, he liked to lie, cheat, and steal. Rest in peace, Eddie Guerrero. Um, he would get, he, this one blew my mind because uh, I would say, I've had beers with you in the past, Kahuna. We've enjoyed that. I, <laughs> I like to, to drink. I have it in a little bit. Um, we have on the show. Yeah. Me and, <laughs> me and old uh, Andy Lawson over here uh, both uh, enjoy alcohol, I would mm. say. That's fair, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I wasn't drinking at age eight, which is the age that, not the age he started drinking at, the age he got his first drunken disorderly charge. <laughs> oh, so I was kind of right. <laughs> yeah. Age eight, he's getting like brought into court, like hey, drunken public kind of a thing. <laughs> hey, were more kids drunk back then, though? <laughs> like, was it just more of a common, you know? It's entirely believable, man. It's uh, that court scene. I'm sorry, that court scene must have been hilarious. If I was a juror in that, like I was just sitting in the courthouse, and then someone just dragged in a kid for a drunken disorderly. Well, and the it's problem so is so fucked, but it, it's so funny. It's hilarious, and then also um, just picture a drunk little kid showing up. But uh, he got a he, imagine getting a DUI in your Hot Wheels. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> it's not good for anybody. But uh, so that's the age that he's at when he gets uh, into trouble for the first time with the law. Really, by age eleven, he's stealing from neighbors' houses, and at age eleven. Um, you know, I think we were probably all adventurous kids, but we never wanted to steal the neighbor's gun, which mm. is what he was doing at age 11. This dude's balls haven't dropped yet, and he's stealing people's guns. Yeah. And every single documentary that you see about him gives him, like, a voice down here. So it's also fun to imagine, like, an 11-year-old kid who's like, give me the gun, <laughs> buddy, you know? He has a full-fledged beard like you yeah, at this point. Yeah, just a straight-up man voice with a beard <laughs> at 11. He's already 40 at age 11. You guys want to watch Paw Patrol? <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm more of a Thomas the Tank Engine kind of guy. Oof, always, always. <laughs> credit, credit where it's due. Um, in 1903, his very strict and, you know, probably abusive parents, uh, it, the father definitely, the mother, I'm just going to go ahead and say she was in on it. Um, they're fed up with Carl's continued drunken troubles with the law. They send his ass to military school. And if you wanted to know how to make a bad situation worse, this is a blueprint for how to do that. OK, Minnesota State Military School. It's like a training academy type place. Later would be the subject of a Bob Dylan song. And also, most recently, one of the first reported cases of COVID-19 in the Minnesota prison system. Mm. Yeah, pretty wild. I think it goes by the name of Red Wing School. Uh, so that's what they wound up calling it. It's not but, a good place to start up. No, no. When Bob Dylan's writing a song about you, something bad happened. Um as the Rosenbergs would tell us, and uh, <laughs> as Joe McCarthy would tell us, and as the Hurricane would tell us. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. Just keep going down the list. Bob Dylan bums me out. How can he not? He's only writing about topics on this show. <laughs> 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 but um, so now uh, he's out there. He is the school is a tough school to begin with. He's a rebellious kid with a mean streak. And between ages 11 and 13, Carl is abused and raped on the regular by staff members in a little dungeon of horror that they referred to as the paint shop. Mm. Uh, do you know why they call it the paint shop, Andy? No. It's, it's mean. I thought maybe you knew this once so I was trying to set you up for a layup, but uh. they call it the paint shop because anyone who walked out of there with the staff members was typically painted with bruises. Oh. So, yeah, if you're a, a nice pale Irish boy like myself, you're coming out of there with some blacks, some blues, some purples, maybe is, a maroon or two. That is horrible. Like, yep. not even on, like in a funny... Like, that's horrible. This was evil. And you're, you're taking a guy who's already... The, a lot of this is going to be where you learn the serial killer thing, where it's like how many serial killers are among us that just aren't activated, if you will, because they, <laughs> they got treated with some semblance of kindness. Right. Now, here's the question. If stand-up comedy was around back then, he had <laughs> so much potential. You know, you're not wrong. That's what if I'm he saying. had went to vaudeville at the time, man, he would have been all right. Take yeah. my wife's head, please. <laughs> <laughs> that was solid. <laughs> so uh, it's a terrible place, this friggin' Red Wing school. And Carl has a way of holding grudges, as we'll continue to learn. And after a few years of beatings, uh, he actually successfully burns the paint shop down. 
Yeah, sets fire, commits one of his first arsons, and by the way, gets away with it. They never figure out that it's him. So it's only because they only know that because he admitted it. I'm guessing. Uh, well, that's here's that thing because we have that loser quality we've talked about. We call it the first example we really have of it was with the, our Calamity Jane episode, where you realize that some people back then, because you couldn't get fact checked, are just completely full of shit. <laughs> so Carl's most of what we know about him is stuff he admitted to. By the way, as we're going to cover when we later get to the murders and stuff, how many murders did he have? Do you remember off the top of your head? I think it was 28 or 20 or 28. What yeah. do you say in his speech? You said at the beginning. Yeah. Well, he that's here's the weird thing. That's what he says in the book. And then the book is you can't tell where he's employing hyperbole. Oh, yeah. So he could be just embellishing the shit out of some of these stories. And we don't know. Um, and what they wind up getting him for was a death sentence anyway. Right. So he, then he's just like, well, I might as well tell him you know, a bunch of other shit. Yeah, might as well. I'm already. <laughs> well, I think that's a mode if you're in there is that like if you confess to something else with even a few facts, then you can extend your death sentence because there would be a new trial. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then the, the privilege of uh, getting uh, more appointments with your attorneys. Maybe the press wants to come talk to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Th- there's a way of, of sometimes a lie. If you're already a dead man walking, which he will be. Um, then there's almost a, a, a perk to having uh, at least making your final days a little bit more interesting. So I'd agree with you on that. Um, by age 14 now, he's uh, already aggressive and systematically worsened. You know, uh, if you want to talk about the idea of trying to rehab these people versus uh, just punishing them more so. Um, this worsens Pan's Ram. He gets paroled from his school immediately. Get, uh, I believe he was paroled from school because he robbed his own mother. Paroled from school? Yeah, that's that's like because these were sentences they were serving. This is like pre juvie kind of a. There was friend. there was a juvenile uh, hall in my town growing up, and like we did not know any of those kids, and they were marched around. So I can have a little bit of a visual of what this must have been like. Damn, yeah, well, it's definitely it's it's military school, not like like when I joined the military and everybody's like, "Thank you for serving our country." This was like, oh, these kids have to have somebody breathing down their neck at all times. So um, I got one killer piece of uh, trivia for uh, for good old Andy here in a okay. second, but but uh, <laughs> unintentional on that one, too. Sure. Um, but start thinking of your casting couch, because uh, I think you're going to the more we describe this guy, I think the better uh, casting couch you're going to have for him at the end. Oh, yeah. Oh, Bill Hader, for sure. Bill Hader. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I know where you're going with this. I'll, if I have it written down already, then that'll be cool. Nice. <laughs> Well, the two of you, I'm curious who you're both going to land on for him. But uh, by age 14, uh, he is now straight up an alcoholic, runs away from home, and he's living as a railroad bum. And he was traveling by train cars, which for some reason, due to like Vival Goes West, we have a romantic notion of. Hmm. I uh, I read something that co- like draw drew distinctions between like a hobo, a bum, a drifter. And it was like all of these specific sex of uh the indigent population a subculture Uh, yeah yeah yeah. so like a hobo was somebody who was willing to work for work but would travel for work and a bum was just somebody who wouldn't work and i was like oh this is fascinating you know it's a good um distinction on that stuff too because there is also like the uh i remember there was that episode of mad men that spooked me a little bit when they said that they would put the the hobos back then would put symbols on your mailbox Oh, in front see, of your house, like who was like, and they're like, "This is a good. You'll get food here, or this person will shoot at you. Stay away." So there was a whole hidden language amongst them with their symbols and shit. And uh, so we do have this romantic notion of traveling by, you know, rail cars, and you know, uh, at this point, Carl is uh, living his um, uh, that Britney Spears movie, pretty much. You know, he's out there on his own. You know, he's he's doing it. You know, um, he's having his sisterhood of the traveling pants. Um, he's living. Yes. Well, speaking of traveling pants, um, he's living as a railroad bum and uh, it's not really a pleasant existence. Uh, There's a time that he admits to later on. And it's one of those things in his uh, autobiography. It's mostly they can't tell he's a narcissist with some of the lies he's telling. But this one particular one they think is probably true because it really paints him as a victim and it doesn't look good for him at all. Um, He pretty much admits that as a, a young Carl was gang raped by a group of hobos on one of these train rides. Jesus. So it's just getting worse and worse for this kid. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, it, it's not crazy to think how a guy like that could look at humanity and be full of uh, nihilism and, and feel nothing. 
which, uh, by the way, shout out to the movie The Big Lebowski, because I uh, I was calling it nihilism until mm. I saw that. And then I was like, oh, nihil. Oh, I know those guys. They're nihilists, man. Yeah. <laughs> so the modern train car, this is like um, like punk rock subculture stuff. People travel around in those pe- prefabricated homes now. So when your uh-huh. home comes on a flatbed and then it gets dropped off and like the people are traveling around in them now as opposed because apparently trains are way too difficult these days. I think they've sped up a bit. I'm trying to think of some of the uh, yeah. the movies and shit that I've seen over the years when um, uh, like a, a, a bum would get the shit kicked out of him. I think, what's it, Christopher McCandless, the guy who was traveling out to Alaska? I don't right? know. Well, he was the guy they made. Um, oh, Into the Wild? Yeah. No, not Into the Wild. They no. made uh, Into the Wild was Jack London. Um, but the, the, when the guy went out there, he eventually gets the shit kicked out of him by... Uh, Call the Wild is Jack London. I'm sorry. I fucked Into that one the up. Wild is uh, with right. Emile Hirsch. Yeah, yeah that's, that's and the And he has a playing. ridiculous bush in that movie. <laughs> like, there's one scene where he's naked, and I'm like, okay, I get what they're trying to go for, but don't Daniel Day-Lewis the bush, yeah. you know? <laughs> who, who knew he was Serbian? Um, but uh, so side note, uh, the character, uh, a character, very small uh, arc on the show, Oz on HBO, was a, a young man uh, by the name of uh, Adam Gunzel, right? Gunzel. And his last name is actually taken from the term Gunsel, which uh, is a meaning amongst the hobo community for a submissive young man kept by another hobo as a sex slave. Hmm. Yeah. We knew we were getting dark here on this one today, guys. Yeah, right? What's in that stick and bindle? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Leather goods, I suppose. It's a small dungeon in a bag. But yeah, a uh, it comes from the Yiddish word, uh, a Yiddish term rather, but it's similar to the the word catamite. So um, he definitely had a, a rough time on the uh, the trains traveling around here, and he would uh, he get they find him and like these truant officer types would throw him into reform schools. So he's getting into reform schools. He's also still pulling off strings of robberies here and there. He's a young, drunk, angry 15-year-old. Where can we send him, Andy? I think uh, Leavenworth eventually, but I don't know where you're going with this. Well, Leavenworth's an interesting place because that's technically, they have a military sect of that prison okay. for, for people who are in the military. So when you're a young, drunk, angry 15-year-old, what recruiter's looking for someone just like you? The army. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> So he winds up in the army because he didn't test high enough to get into the Navy. And um, How'd you pull that off? That's, <laughs> I just said the Navy worked out good. That's, uh, I also had, uh, I had Kahuna take my test for me. But, um, oh, shit. Did you have to wear Cracker Jacks at some point? You know it. Oh, did they have the flap on the back or no? Uh, or am I making the flap on the back up? Well, there is the flap on the back, but there's multiple flaps, though. Because um, there's also uh, the, the dress blues are the true Cracker Jack looking uniform. Okay. And uh, there's um, there's plenty of uses for those flaps. I'll put it that way. Yeah. It gets discerning at times. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, I lost so much weight in boot camp that when they fitted me for my uniforms, then when we were wearing them at graduation, I looked like uh, when a little kid wears his dad's suit around. Oh, that's so, cute. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's terrible, dude. Yeah. But <laughs> um, so uh, he winds up joining the army, right? And just a matter of time until old Carl Pan's winds up fucking something up here and he uh he has a larceny charge and this gets carl in the very same prison that will be the location of his eventual execution right so imagine like with the place you get executed a place you die is like you've oh yeah i spent some time out there before mm. <laughs> yeah. i i enjoy uh cape cod in the summers but martha's jr is great this time of year <laughs> said jfk jr um but oh uh God. terrible tragedy um but anyway, uh, this larceny charge uh, gets him a couple of years in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And get this, his prison sentence is approved by, this one's exciting. You want to say it? It's Taft, right? Yep, president. future President yeah. Taft, at the time Secretary of War. Any idea who he's serving as Secretary of War for, Kahuna? Perhaps a president you don't want to fuck with? Oh my God, really? Yep, Teddy Roosevelt. So. I love how he just slowly crops up around all these different stories. And it's always random, too. That's my favorite part of the show, to be honest. <laughs> just where te- where where he'll pop up. Oh, man. Well, so not only is Taft a future president, he's the current secretary of war, signs off on this thing that gets uh, Carl sent to a couple years in Leavenworth. 
And uh, also, he will go on to be a Supreme Court justice. Fun fact, you want to sound smart at a party in the next couple of months or weeks after you hear this. He's the only Supreme Court justice that was also president. You know it. Psh, so. That's not that smart. No, that's it. But you yeah, know, it's smart you now. Know how smart that shit is compared. <laughs> uh, you ain't learning nothing on Legion of Skanks. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, Carl makes it a point to remember that Taft was the guy that signed off on him here. And as Carl says himself, during his two-year prison sentence at Leavenworth, any good that was left in him was beaten out of him. All right. He was not a fan. Uh, so he is fighting guards regularly. Um, you ever see the movie Bronson? I have a note about that. Who would win in a fight? Ooh, this is right. good already. We got Carl Panzeran versus Charles Bronson. Who wins? I don't know. Br- Bronson, pretty badass, tough dude. He's like uh, Brid- Britain's uh, Charles Manson, I'd call him. But he's jacked and he loves to get into these fights with his prison guards. And then you have Panzram, who, keep in mind, he was a big guy to begin with. Panzer, Panzram, like Andy was saying. So that's yeah. the guy's got a tank build to him already, right? He's about six foot. He's a powerful guy, okay? And now he's in Fort Leavenworth. And he's a young kid, too. Imagine, like, getting to, like, varsity football playing years, right? That's where he's at, and he's spending this time in Leavenworth. What's the year we're looking at? Uh, the year I don't have off the top of my head, um, but he joined the Army at age 15. So he's keep in mind, he's probably 16, 17 at this point. So you're literally hitting adulthood and you're working forced hard labor at Camp Leavenworth. And he's already got a mean streak and he's rebellious. So it's kind of wild that way. Now you're getting this guy to have a crazy build to him. So Panzram versus Bronson. Charles Bronson. That's I'm going to go. I'm going to go Panzram because he's younger. He'll get back up way quicker. I don't know. Charlie Bronson was nothing to mess with. Yeah, it's either. a movie worth watching. Man. Yeah, definitely check it out. Yeah, I um, mean, there's a little too much naked dude in it, but there's two naked dude references in both of the movies that we've referenced so far. Well, also Oz and Oz has uh, well, Oz. male nudity. Yeah, yeah, Oz. That's the problem. Oz Yo, straight up Christopher Maloney <laughs> naked. Yeah, if you want to see Elliot Stabler's dick, you got to go to. You're not going to see it on uh, Law and Order, but you will see it to the point where you're like, enough already. <laughs> uh, but so they got. Uh, we'll go back to that one at the end because I want to set up the full thing for. Because I, I think, I think Kahuna is going to change his mind by the end of the story on this one. Change my mind on what? On on who you're picking, Bronson versus Panzeram. Okay. So. We'll see on that one, man. But uh, so during this two-year prison sentence, he's uh, a big guy, like we said, um, and he's he's now he's jacked as hell too, because hard labor, dude. All right. And, he's doing and, those seventy-two hour fasts. No, no, he's not doing those, <laughs> man. That is the beauty of shoulders, by the way. People assume I'm jacked sometimes, but uh-huh. I'm not. It it looks bad underneath this shirt. This shirt covers a lot of wounds. <laughs> um, but now he gets out, and of course they give him a dishonorable discharge, like uh, which is just such a perfect military thing, too. We have a, a legitimate psychopath uh, in custody, but we're going to release him back out there. But he'll have a dishonorable discharge, so he can't work at McDonald's. I'm not making that up. If you have a dishonorable discharge, McDonald's will not hire you. Really? So that's one incentive of getting a dishonorable discharge. The only. It I mean, is the teardrop tattoo of the military. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but, man, this dude is scary looking, too. Well, just you wait, my friend. Um, after his release, uh, he goes on a little mini tour of the U.S. You know, Andy and I both like to work as road comics. And uh, you recently bounced around the entire South pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I bought a great uh, yellow watermelon. Didn't even know those exist. <laughs> uh, went to multiple fireworks stands and I uh, got a tortoise. So I forgot about the tortoise. That's yeah. true. The tortoise's name, oddly, Carl Panzram. Uh, <laughs> so, you got to work with that. Uh. But, <laughs> but uh, Carl goes on a little mini tour of his own, uh, robbing, burglarizing, and sodomizing his way from California to Connecticut with stops in Texas and Idaho, of course. He regularly gets incarcerated during his tour uh, and even spends a little time in the first of our loser receptions in the famed Sing Sing prison which will also be the site of the execution of the Rosenbergs. Now, if you're saying, hey, where's this Rosenbergs episode? Because I want to go check it out. Uh, you'll notice it's not available on iTunes or SoundCloud because that's Patreon only, baby. Mm. All right? you got to pay at least five bucks to For get it. For just a $5 donation, that's all we ask. Times are tough. If you don't have more than that, I totally get it. 
If uh, you know, but for five bucks, you get on the Patreon, you start getting all sorts of crazy stuff in here. Man, man. do repeat guests get free access to the Patreon? They should. Now they that you're certainly that. probably should. <laughs> yeah, you know? dude, I'll tell you what. You give me five bucks, I'll give you full access. Right <laughs> now. <laughs> no, it's uh, we gotta you work. Sidestep the question with that answer. Well, I actually have to work out of some drug deals on some stuff with people because uh, a lot of good people have told me they're like, hey, listen, I love this show, so whatever it takes, that that keeps it going. So if you like the show and you help us out on Patreon, then I can keep doing these free ones every Tuesday for you. Gotcha. So mm. get a load of this one, man. Carl is not always outside the law, though. Sometimes he finds honest work, like as a strike breaker. You want, a, want to guess what a strike breaker is, either of you? Oh, strike breaker? I mean, he's, um, what do they call that? Something uh, to do with the railroad? It's uh, breaking of. any union. Like you, Pretty uh, much. Yeah. He was also, for a time, a mule skinner. And I don't even know what that is. I feel like that's kind of self-explanatory with that one. Yeah, perhaps. But what if it's worse than we think? Oh, God. There that's is. What I'm saying. Now, that's interesting that a. Because I never heard about anybody eating a mule or wearing like, oh, that's a nice mule jacket you've got. So what are you skinning those mules for? I think there is some use for mule hides. Um, and it could just. I, I do like the idea, though, that a psychopath of sorts is going to find himself at home in some sort of a butcher type field. Yeah. Yeah. So that part's interesting too. Um, the the key with the strike breaker thing, you're absolutely right. By the way, that's that's literally where they hire muscle to go rough up the people who are trying to unionize. It was, it was pre Antifa, Antifa. Yeah, you they're know, just these, like causing trouble, fellas. Well, it's weird too because then we also have the lose reception from the Molly Maguires, right? So the Molly Maguires in coal mining Pennsylvania were Irish immigrants who uh, some some immigrants, some born here of native uh, of Irish descent rather. Um, and they were getting almost a mafioso kind of thing where it was like if their foreman was a dick, they'd kill the foreman. Jesus, so, this dude's like Hydra. He just always shows up in the fucking MCU. He does. And uh, and also, now that he's a strike breaker, this is a big guy that's going to go rough up whoever's trying to make labor reforms. And he goes, and that was my honest work. I mean, you know, it wasn't always crime. Sometimes I just beat up people who were fighting for human rights at the workplace. <laughs> so he's got a complicated uh, life here but he is what he is man he's a boozing lying fighting sodomizing kind of a guy um jordan peterson did a couple of different talks regarding carl panzeram and like every no shit. yeah like every other topic that jordan peterson broaches he made carl panzeram incredibly boring <laughs> well if you think about it um and you take down what carl panzeram's really all about yeah. uh sodomy is actually why you should clean your room yeah that said guy. Kermit the Frog. Yeah. Tell, that's a pretty good Jordan Peterson. That's I a very be good Jordan Peterson. <laughs> for for a, a whim like that yeah. that I just went now on? Hit me with that. Now I need to take a Kalanapin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. My daughter's pretty hot, though. <laughs> Eat meat. <laughs> no. uh, that guy fell off. Well, this show's falling off, too. Larry, where are you? I need you. <laughs> <laughs> Not for nothing. <laughs> oh, I got tortured on that one, man. Yeah justifiably too by the way not for you say not for nothing said like past white tense. chicks say like i don't like it what you mean by that. <laughs> <laughs> but um carl's mini tour getting a lot of jail time right getting Moving a lot of trouble right here <laughs> oh i'm good at these <laughs> but carl is a a boozing bastard and he's uh he can't join the U.S. Army anymore because he's got a dishonorable discharge. They don't let you back in. They barely let you back in with an honorable. I know. I tried once. I did. I did like one comedy tour in Florida, and I was like, "All right, it's time. I got to go back in." That's and it. I was just like, nah. I'm done. One weekend <laughs> at Winter Circle in Lakeland, Florida, and I was like, "I have to go back into the military. <laughs> Get back on the government teat." Um, but uh, he winds up trying to join the Mexican Army. And oh, I, I didn't read about those. Yeah, it does not go well for him. He winds up getting uh, a, it, it's a, a, a moot effort, if you will. So uh, he tries or he he does get in. Tries to join the Mexican army. Tough outfit to get in with. They're nervous about there's some tensions with America, too, because just a few years earlier, old Pancho Villa got whacked. Oh, uh, um, so there's a little espionage element. To yeah. It. So there could be, oh, would we really want this guy here? Mm -hmm. And it's not exactly the San Patricios where they were uh, waging wars. uh for a country that wasn't yet established. America's America and Mexico's Mexico for the most part around this time. I mean, in this one instance, they really kind of dodged a bullet here. So Yeah, the Mexican army's like, ooh, uh, we don't we, know about yeah, you, we don't know. Carl. Uh, <laughs> but shortly after this uh, failed attempt, this is when Carl's life gets extra dark. All right, so if you were uncomfortable already, buckle up. 
It's going to okay. happen. All right, hit me. Sunquist uh, family, cover your ears. No, those good people. By the way, Carl has an album out coming out soon. Uh, he messaged me a couple tracks to take a look at, so we will take Carl? Yeah, Carl Sunquist. Carl Pansram. Oh, wow, you're yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> Carl Pansram's mixtapes were dropped off to me. <laughs> okay, so was, yeah, also, side note to the casting qu- uh, couch thing you mentioned All previously. Right. Uh, is the answer Billy Bob Thornton? <laughs> because the character in Sling Blade is remarkably like Panzram. A lot, yeah. And the character of the what people would refer, refer to as Sling Blade, his name is Carl in the movie, Carl Childers. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so I, I wonder if that written, produced, and acted in by Billy Bob Thornton was heavily influenced by Pan's Ram. Add him to the list, because typically with Casting Couch, it's just kind of like, end of the episode, who do you see playing this dude in a movie? Uh, no, it's okay. okay. But like, no, that's perfectly but fine. But like, that's, Thornton, a that's, good, yeah. that's a good option. We'll contra- if you come with anybody else, too, then we'll contrast them off of whoever um, okay. Kahuna comes up with. So I like this. Um, so uh, Carl claims around this time to have uh, sodomized beaten, strangled to death, and then robbed a man outside of El Paso, Texas, which to me seems like a lot of effort for $35. But keep in mind, that's seven months worth of Patreon-exclusive content from American Loser. <laughs> so, I love how you took the math. Old oh, Carl uh, winds up using some nicknames around this time. Did you get a load of any of his aliases? Oh, dude, I was so bummed on all of his aliases. I, I didn't there's find one that's w- very exciting, Is by there? the way. I, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll read the list. You tell me which one stood out to okay. you. Okay. You ready? So here's the list we have so far of some of the aliases. He was arrested and incarcerated under the following right. names. Uh, the, the list includes, but is not limited to, Jack Allen, yeah. Jeff Rhodes, yeah. Christian Cordes. That one's okay. Jeff Baldwin. John O'Leary, and then finally, my most, my favorite one, lose reception time, folks. He was once incarcerated under the name Jefferson Davis. No oh, way. No President of the Confederacy. <laughs> wow. Also owner of the Boar's Nest in uh, Hazard County in the Dukes of Hazard. Oh, oh. Shit, that's right. What are you doing <laughs> watching that show? That, that's a banned television show. <laughs> <laughs> now it is. <laughs> Well, uh, Pans Ram's career of crime starts to see him using these different names pretty often, right? Uh, he's serving prison sentences just as often. Dude, this is where he goes off the rails. Is that fair to say? Oh, he I hasn't say already? No, like, he's... he's no. If, if We almost had to do a two-parter on this, but we're killing it with time because Andy keeps me brief on stuff. Fair enough. But, dude, this is where I, I wanted to make sure, because if you skip a sentence reading about this guy, you miss something... You just weren't prepared. It doesn't for it. seem like he had enough years to do all this. True. Yeah, that's the problem, and it, it, it makes you kind of like envious of like, wow, I mean, the energy level, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> like if I go to shop, right, I'm like, I'm done. For, I'm done this week. Yeah, you I know. I'm happy we got you out of the house. To be yeah, honest, buddy, it's been a rough stretch. The move. Yeah. But now they, uh, it, it's his life gets extra ridiculous around this time because. Uh, the prison stints are often violent. Carl openly fights the guards a lot, completely defiant of people here. And he starts to develop a penchant for escaping from these prisons. So uh, get a load of this one. This, this story alone could have been an entire episode of Loser. So we're not skipping over any of the details of it, but this, this one story I'm about to tell is pretty nuts. Um, he would escape from county jails on the regular, but uh, eventually was sentenced to a full year out in Montana. Right. He would then escape, get caught again and be forced to serve an additional year. OK, so he, he's he's able to pull off. These are like relatively decently secured prisons. Now he gets himself out to Oregon. OK, you ever been out to Oregon? No, no. I have not been out to Oregon. I had, I had one of the I was in Seattle for a writer's conference for when I was in college. I don't think that's Oregon. I think that's Washington. It, it is. Okay. But the idea I, I there was people I had no I have a terrible sense of geography. I couldn't say with. that definitively either. I, was like, <laughs> I think it is. But we don't know if it exists. It's. Uh, I know they had a franchise yeah. NBA team, <laughs> but um, no. So uh, when I was out there, people were telling me, like, "Oh yeah, I live in um, I live in Oregon," and I was like, "Isn't that like super far away?" And they're like, "Only a couple hours." So it's like uh, you know, you're meeting people who are like telling you, "You should come hang out with us over in Oregon," and it's like. The equivalent Jersey's such a small state we don't realize people have to travel much more mm. you can do north south of this state in two hours right but if we wanted to go hang out in pennsylvania 
Pennsylvania changes time zones on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it gets a little intense. But um, anyway, uh, so he's out in uh, Oregon now, mm -hmm. and he meets uh, uh, in the prison. He's he gets you know under the the control of the warden, uh, warden Harry Minto. Okay. And See these when you get into the prison names, these are the names that should have been the AKAs. Because the people he escaped prison with and then the, the guards at the prison and the prison uh, overseers, they have really fun names. There's a guy, Otto something in this. He's coming in right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a great, this is a great alias. Those other names bored me so much that like, I don't know. It's I like, wonder if that was by design. It's disappointing. I was disappointed. That's be funny. more, be more creative. It's like a guy who was so creative with his time. I was like, why not be so creative with the names? Exactly. Well, I mean, can you imagine how much worse uh, my comedy career would go if I was uh, going by Kevin Burke instead of KP Burke? Yeah. Well, it's all in a name, fellas, trying to tell you. I changed my name in comedy like five times over the, my entire 10-year career. <laughs> Not a strong move. No, because then people are like, who's this open micer starting <laughs> over again? Yeah, yeah, which might also be a strong move. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so now he's in jail and the, the aforementioned gentleman that, uh, Andy was referring to is a, a pretty interesting name too. So the prison ward, ward in, I should say, um, is Harry Minto, right? And Carl is sentenced to seven years at this one prison and he's going to be underneath Warden Minto's, uh, control. And Warden Minto's a bit of a bastard, all right? Hard labor kind of thing, rough treatment of the prisoners. And, uh, it, it, that's one of those things too, because now if you're being, an asshole to people that have nothing to do other than to plot how to rebel against you. <laughs> There's no like, well, you know, at least it's really not that bad when you look at it. Or I just don't deal with that guy. You know, these you, you're sowing some seeds of uh, discontent. Yeah. And uh, Carl told anybody who would listen when they sentenced him to seven years in this prison, he goes, I'm not serving the full seven and none of you can make me. I guarantee you I'm going to be out of here before then. <laughs> and uh, he was a tough dude, man. He really was. Now, what um, was he in there? For to begin with, was it like was it the the murder thing for thirty five bucks? No, or? he actually is a he's about to. The story now is technically his first on paper trail to anything that leads to a murder. Uh, okay. So his buddy is uh, a guy by the name of uh, I believe it was uh, Otto Hooker. Otto Hooker. Otto That's Hooker. A good one. Yeah. So um, Otto Hooker and him are going to break out of this prison in Oregon. Warden uh, Minto's uh, prison. So, and if you look at, uh, if you ever look at a picture of uh, Warden Minto, he looks like um, the Who But W B Mason guy, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? The deli fella. Yeah. Well, uh, the, and the uh, the the office supply guy it looks like a curly mustache. Oh, so it's not the deli guy. Well, because I wonder, because W B Mason, they do, they do have everything. Uh. That'd be a good sponsor for the show. Yeah. Um, but uh, so Hooker and uh, Panzram, they pull off this uh, escape, right? And during the escape, they wind up getting into a little bit of a gunfight. And uh, Hooker has a gun and gets challenged by Minto himself during the escape. And Hooker shoots Minto, the warden who's been, you know, capturing him and not capturing him, but uh, is attempting to recapture him to put him back into these harsh conditions that he's created for the prisoners to the point where this dude Hooker had to escape. He winds up shooting the warden dead in the fucking face. Mm. Yep. And so as a accessory prior to the act, this is technically Carl Panzram's first on paper murder. Yeah. So now keep in mind, it, we don't know if he's full of shit on his other stories and we don't know a lot of this other stuff too, but he is, uh, he certainly got some baggage. Isn't it weird that part of human nature kind of want to make you, kind of wants to make you believe that like, well, if Carl met me, he would see that I'm cool and he wouldn't rape me or murder me. He would just like, we would probably hang out for a little yeah. bit and then part <laughs> ways, you know, like you probably. kind of still, no matter how despicable the character, you kind of still want to be like, no, we'd probably, we'd probably like have some beers and then like call it a night, you know? And I don't understand that part of human nature. Like, why do you want to kind of associate with this dude? It's our borderline narcissism, I think. Is it? And, and wait till you, because the next part of this is it shows he had to be a charming guy. Because mm. it's it, like a Norman Bates quality. Huh? Well, that I don't even know about charming, but it's just like he looks like a hard ass who knows what he's doing. And people tend to follow those people because they're so noncommittal in general. 
that you wind up kind of not falling under the spell of the guy, but you're like, well, this guy seems to know what he's doing. So you go with that. Because the, the next part of the story is bizarre. I mean, not that anything else has been normal so far. Um, but uh, he winds up getting recaptured himself, right? So pans around. This escape attempt does not work completely. And this is like three cameras on every corner. Oh, yeah. You know, this is pre-surveillance state. So how do you... And, uh, with this is, shitty aliases, that's how you get caught. You're not too far removed. This might be concurrent with the times of Dillinger busting out of maximum security prisons and uh, you know people hiding guns for the work party to shoot the guards watching them as they dig holes on the side of a road. I mean, it was, it was a wild time, man. It yeah. really was. Um, so he gets caught again. Uh, now, this is the second time here. He's been telling everybody that he's not going to uh, uh, finish this prison sentence. Uh, Carl gets thrown back into jail, escapes a year later, right? Two more gunfights, you know, until finally he winds up uh, being recaptured again. So this guy's busted out of jail twice so far. One of the times, I swear to God, chisel on the bars, right? I'm not saying someone sent it to him in a wedding cake or a birthday cake or something, but he had a chisel and he literally chiseled his way out of the bars and just popped out. Also, this whole time, like, he's been doing stuff, it's just been him, right? Like, it's not even, like little help here or there with some he had cohorts sometimes but except they, for otto at this point i think yeah, yeah otto was the only one and and i wonder because otto might have had that friendship with him you were talking about where you're like we both want to get out of here so let's not uh, waste our time sodomizing each other <laughs> <laughs> so um but yeah carl definitely uh, the uh best laid plans you know <laughs> um so he now again one more year here in the prison uh, Warden Minto's been murdered. There's been a second gunfight to bring him back in. And now finally, in 1918, at now age 27. Okay, how old are you, Cahoons? 25. 25, all right. So uh, roughly around the same age. You're now out. You've been a booze bag since you were age eight. You've killed people. You've been you know, committing uh, all sorts of crimes all over the country. You know what I mean? You're, you're a wild guy, but you're still a young man in a lot of ways, right? Just living, man. It's Just spring break. <laughs> spring break. <laughs> Dude, he uh, he hops on a train and goes east. And he just goes, well, I'm never going to the Pacific Northwest again. Let me tell you that much. <laughs> so he gets out of there. And uh, it's it's 1918 now. Okay. So a lot of stuff going on in the world. Roaring 20s are right around the corner. Right? World War I is uh, coming to a close. and uh, Or it should be closed already, actually. Now I'm thinking about it. But... Um, it's uh, anarchy, baby. It's just nothing but anarchy. So uh, Carl escapes on that speeding train heading west. We might have broken the kahuna just now. Um, and he heads east. And it had been 15 years. You want to talk about holding a grudge, by the way? This is a, like, you've been through some shit in your life, Andy. Do you hold a grudge more than 15 years? No, no. No? I don't think so. I've been told Irish Alzheimer's is you forget oh. uh, everything except the beefs. Okay. Right? That's what the, the joke was in my family. Um, but interestingly enough, a 15-year-old, over 15-year-old beef is about to get settled. Uh, Kahuna, just because I know you were listening and you, you play the role of the audience on the show sometimes, uh, what was the name of the fellow that signed off and approved his initial imprisonment at Fort Leavenworth? Taft. Yeah. President Howard Taft. Mm. William Howard Taft. I'm sorry. This is my favorite part of the story. Dude. This shit is like poetic almost. Oh. Um, you want to tell it? Okay, so uh, he takes, all right. he robs Taft's house about seven years after his presidency, mm -hmm. stealing a assorted amount of jewels, but also one of the previous president's guns. Not just any gun, a uh, forty-five caliber nineteen eleven, right? That like that every badass war movie you've ever seen uh since world war one the u.s army and marine corps have been using this pistol this yeah. is this is the american iconic pistol and 45 caliber does some heavy damage look what the guy was able to do with a, a chisel now he's got a 45 caliber yes. gun that belongs to a former president so uh he takes this jewelry and this gun and fences the jewelry for about forty thousand dollars at this Christ. point in in 1918 money 1918 money and uh he buys with this money he now buys a yacht which becomes arguably the worst boat even including the titanic the uh astica 
Astica. Yeah. yeah. A-S-T. So, oh, wow. That's Kahuna just rolled his eyes like we made a pun. I didn't realize it until I said it. A-S-T-I-K-A is the name of it. Not the ass sticker. <laughs> Maybe let's just say like Aztec as in the island and an early spelling of that. Maybe the Aztec. I like Aztec. it. Like, it sounds more formal that Classier. way. But um, it's a very formal name for what essentially becomes a rape boat. Mm-hmm. He uh, picks up some young opportunistic fellas in New York. And uh, he's like, no, no, no. Bring all your stuff on the boat. This is going to be a long trip. De- you know what? Definitely bring all of your money. And then uh, he drives out to somewhere off of uh, Long Island Sound Mm -hmm. and um, has his way, I think is a good way to put it, and then murders them and then takes their stuff. And this goes on and he kills 10 people with the previous, well, 10 victims. Well, I mean, they're victims either way. He double victim. 10, yeah. Yeah, 10 was the number he he did. 10 with the previous president's gun. And this is the level of like this dude, like I'm just saying proficient, go getter. You know, these aren't words like, you know, like this is pre Google oh appointments. God. This is pre everything, you know. Well, he's uh, the, the term is Shanghai, by the way, to, to take these sailors out of New York City. So the sailors come in on a port like, oh, I got to find another ship to go out on. And then you got this guy like, oh, I got a ship. We'll go in here because he's bouncing around. He's international at this point, too. There's there's times when he winds up in uh, like Latin coastal. America. Yeah, he's, he's bouncing around all over the place. And um, also just to, to draw a little a little tidbit here that I thought was worth mentioning. Uh, Taft at this time, when when the break in happens at the house, the he's living in Connecticut because I believe he's uh, I think he's at Yale or Harvard. I can't remember. Um but that's the time frame. This is right before he's about to become uh, one of the Supreme Court justices. So imagine that you have one of the president's guns and you're committing murder. And then that guy becomes a Supreme Court justice. And now you're murdering people with a Supreme Court justice's stolen gun. Oh, and by the way, you got $40,000 worth of his shit in bonds and jewels, like he was saying. Um, wow. And one of the places, too, Long Island Sound is definitely a location for him with a lot of these murders. Uh, Ten in total. Uh, his final two victims actually escaped, by the way. Did you get that part? I don't know. I just know that the ship sank off of Atlantic City. That's your Jersey connection for the week, folks. The wreck is somewhere outside Atlantic City. He, uh. The Akista um, is uh, the, the name of the ship, and it uh, it crashed or ran aground off the coast of Atlantic City, and uh, Panzran was able to uh, get back onto shore, and his two other uh, sailors who would be victims, you know, um, which, by the way, I don't know how far into his process he had gotten. So I bet you one of the sailors was like, man, things just keep getting worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, but uh, anyway, uh, those two guys wind up escaping. And uh, now Kahuna brought up a photo of Panzer. And can we talk about what a, this guy? Which one? Because there's like. It looks different. He looks different. Yeah, because he the loses seven, the three, mustache. Yeah, the 7390 uh, inmate number, that's a rather sophisticated look. And then even the one above that, um, 3164, if you're on the internet now looking them up yourself, that looks like a bit, uh, what's that wine that has the... Um, 19 Crimes. 19 Crimes, yeah. yes. That looks like a bit like the fellow who's on the 19 Crimes model. But then by 1614, he has completely lost his looks. Yeah, and he's going off of uh, the inmate numbers on some of the mugshots, and he does have a... Uh, Again, not an old guy. Didn't get to live to be an old guy, but also age is... Um, a lot of hard years. Yeah, he puts some mileage Is that going to happen to me? No. You're, no? Look at you, buddy. You're already killing it. I know. <laughs> I'm already 40. How old am I? 25? <laughs> Keep going. So uh, now he's got the... He's in a little bit of trouble here because uh, he winds up getting back into uh, you know trouble with the, the law, if you will. Um, he would spend the next few years, uh, this is according to his biography, which we're about to get into uh, the, the, the finality of the story here. Um, in his own biography, he is talking about how uh, he was spending some time down near uh, Angola, uh, Portuguese Angola, I should say, uh, Portuguese uh, colony in uh, southern Africa, right? And he talks about uh, a bunch of crimes he committed. One of them, uh, he claims to have uh, killed a boy who was 11 years old. And in his confession to this murder, he writes, The brains came out of the ears. Does that happen? You think that happens? It's, I don't know. His brains come out. This is the full quote. His brains came out of his ears when I left him, and he will never be any debtor. 
He also claims that he once hired a boat of six rowers. So I'm assuming probably, you know, uh, African fellas, okay. right? Rowing this boat, sitting there like, oh, this, uh, this, you know, white colonial guy here seems to have some money, whatever. We'll do this job and he'll give us, you know, something. And uh, he then shoots all the rowers with a Luger pistol and then threw their bodies overboard and fed them to the crocodiles. Mm. Sounds almost like it could be bullshit, right? There's a lot of things in this story that sound like it could be bullshit, but who am I to say? Well, uh, this guy's borderline antichrist if all this shit is true, right? Which is hilarious because when he comes back to uh, the United States, he also says that he murdered two small boys, uh, beating one of them to death with a rock in good old Salem, Massachusetts. Nothing bad ever happened out there, guys. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So uh, he also says that uh, at around this time, the 45, I guess, disappears. We don't really know after the uh, Kitsa. We don't know what happened to that gun because um, I couldn't find anything else for it. No, I, that, yeah. That he just kind of chucked it in the Hudson. Well, uh, he's uh, he's got he's working some honest jobs here. He's working as a night watchman a little bit. He's still got other boats. He's docking up in Poughkeepsie. Right. Uh, he's stealing fishing equipment. The guy's all over the place. Um and he winds up, again, another escape from jail here, too, by the way, because they arrested a guy by the name of Captain John O'Leary, okay, who just happened to be Carl Perrins for him. Uh, he's able to pull off all these crazy things, man. Uh, Jeff Baldwin, another one of his names that he used, he gets put into Clinton Prison in uh, Danamora, New York, all right, and gets discharged in 1928, and then uh, gets out and freshly decides to go out and commit a murder in Baltimore that summer, right? You got any plans? What'd you do on your summer vacation, Andy? Well, you know, a little sailing. That's it. <laughs> um, Mingle with the locals. Yeah, we did that. Uh, we toured a winery, and then there was, um, you know, just sodomy and murder. And then before we knew it, it was fall. Oh, well, that's you know, the standard pumpkin shit. patches. <laughs> well, uh, so 1928, by the end of that summer, good old Carl gets arrested in Baltimore for a burglary he pulls off in Washington, D.C. Um, he robbed a dentist. And as we've covered on the show, don't fuck with dentists. They're just, they always win. You know what Carl needed? He needed a murder palace, like his friend. H.H. H. Holmes? Yeah. <laughs> he needed a murder palace. If he had that, he probably would have went a little longer, survived a little longer, been a little more organized. I wonder if H.H. H. Holmes is just Pan's Ram with anxiety and social, de- you know. <laughs> At least H.H. H. Holmes had the decency to socially distance, you know what I mean? <laughs> wasn't, there other, wasn't there some other iconic American figure who had a, que- a boat of questionable ethics? Oh, there's a couple. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we so can even go topical mo- right now if we needed to, current oh, event-wise. Okay. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, no, I feel like there was a religious leader who had a boat of, or a um, fiction writer, L. Ron Hubbard. Didn't L. Ron Hubbard have oh, a... Yeah. A uh, rather quest or sea uh, uh, yeah. patrol or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, Let's stop before we get killed. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we don't have the the to quote Stanhope. We don't have the legal team to come back okay. on this show. <laughs> I mean, like, who am I to say anything? You know, this is all hyperbolic. Indeed. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> speaking of hyperbole, uh-huh. uh, Pandram's arrested now, right? Okay. And he admits to a bunch of murders. And he's giving them the case. He's like, oh, by the way, I murdered this kid. I murdered that kid. I murdered all these people. And uh, he also winds up like even writing this stuff, uh, which we're about to get into the the writing itself. Mm. Um, He also says that he has thoughts about if you want to talk. This is Batman villain shit right here. Ready, Kona? This is the things that he admits to thinking about. Okay. Well, I was thinking about, uh, well, there's a bunch of mass killings I wanted to do. I also thought about poisoning the city's water supply with arsenic. I also debated scuttling a British warship into New York Harbor in order to provoke a war between the United States and Great Britain. Um, also, he would later go on to be played by Jack Nicholson. It's a close, man. He's really, uh, there's there's some bane to his game, too. Mm. You know? It's yeah. a, you came back to die with your city. <laughs> his plan on... Uh, he was uh, born in the darkness, shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the plan he on was. poisoning the water supply was, like, way too in-depth. Like, he didn't just... I was like, I want to get poisoned. I'm going to put it in the well. It was like, I'm going to feed it to pigs, and then I'm going to take the pig meat and put that in the well. Like, he had definite mental problems. Obviously, he had definite mental problems, but also in his own, like, logical reasoning, he added a lot of steps into things that were kind of unnecessary, particularly in the uh, poisoning of the water. Uh, 
without a doubt. And and that's why his autobiography comes into question so often because he, he's not a reliable narrator. <laughs> yes. So he uh, oh, he actually one of those movies. Wait for this. We're going cyclical here as we're wrapping up. Um, he receives a 25 year to life sentence. Right. He has not been given the death penalty yet. He's doing a life sentence. Twenty five uh, to life. What name? <laughs> Uh, th- this one would be his proper name of Carl Panzeram, I believe, at this time. Mm-hmm. And guess where he gets uh, sent? We said it earlier in the episode. Sing, sing? No. Uh, Leavenworth. Fort- yep, Fort Leavenworth, baby. So he is now inmate 31614. And he warned the warden upon his arrival, I'm going to kill the first man that bothers me. So, actually, we're looking at him. He's such a tough-looking guy. It would be hilarious if he had Jordan Peterson's voice. <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying. Every single documentary had him on some Christian Bale stuff. And I don't know if he... Where was, is he? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like... What was his number again, by the way? Uh, 31614. That I think photo is his found shot from that. That's yeah, the yeah. most current one. Good yeah. looks, good looks, Cohen. He lost so much of his neck, too. Yeah, well, I can't talk. I've never had one. Flintstones. Yeah, but he had one. Look at that, you know, like, and it just kind of is like either his shoulders grew or his neck shrunk. So, and it bothers me that in the early mug shots when he was making trouble out in Montana area, uh, that's that's how good of a mustache he had that by shaving it, he completely changed his appearance. It yeah. looks like a completely different dude. Yeah, with mustache, he looks like my dad. Um, then Leavenworth looks like me. So, me mm. with a shaved head. That's when I get my. There's. A, by the way, also. It does look like Sling Blade, though. You there, gotta say, say, it does look like Sling Blade. Absolutely. We'll yeah. post all that on the Instagram and everything, yeah. too, but he does look like he enjoys some French rod daters. <laughs> you know. uh, but now here he is. This is where this is the, the final scene. All right. Is that John Ritter? R.I.P. Yeah, poor guy. Yeah. He had a lot of rules about dating his teenage daughter, but otherwise, not a bad dude. Yeah. Um, problem child, hot gold. Um, but again, he worried. Warns... We're not. We're worried about L. Ron Hubbard's estate suing this podcast, but not John <laughs> not Ritter's. The Ritters. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they're not a litigious people. The Ritters, good folk. <laughs> so he warns. Um, he warns the warden that he's gonna. Uh, he gets a job working in the prison laundry room, but it was right after he said, "I'm gonna kill the first man that bothers me," and uh, fresh into his prison sentence, he beats the prison laundry foreman. A guy by the name of uh, Robert Warnke or Wanky, it, it's Warn, W-A-R-N-K-E, beats him to death. Uh, and because of that beating, now good old Carl Panzram, he ain't doing 25 to life anymore. You got a death sentence coming, buddy. All right, so they're going to give him the death penalty here. And he refuses to allow any appeals to a sentence. This guy wants to die. All right. Uh, he gets uh, human rights people are trying to intervene with him. What? And uh, yeah, dude, that, like literally, they're the people like we're against. Because remember, we talked about it with the electric chair, people were against uh, the death punishment. penalty. Yeah, capital punishment—the punishment, the proper name for it. A little tie-in with the electric chair. He was uh, at one of his prison stays uh, tortured in this thing called a hummingbird, uh, which was a metal bathtub, which you would then be uh, shackled into, and then a low voltage electric current would be administered to you. Like, like as the a, Uncle uh, Fester sticks of the yes, arcade? Oh yes, my yes. God. And it was a behavioral, behavioral collect corrective of the time jesus Christ. so like his case actually did lead to some prison reform there was a time when his name was on people's tongues because of the abuses that he suffered and then how he lost like uh prevalence in american knowledge is kind of unknown to me he well, he should be um because it looks good well the the documentary was excellent too yeah. uh, i don't have netflix anymore so i can't check it out but, um, I'll send you my password. Uh, good guy. What's right up? There. Oh, you're about to get Hulu. You know what? I'm that? about to get that Patreon membership. It's only five dollars <laughs> a month. <laughs> Ross Brewing. Uh, I am good about that stuff. I just need. Uh, we need some more sponsors. But I also, it's tough to go uh, to get a good sponsor on the show, and just be sitting there talking about like, oh, and that's why uh, if you want to get, uh, we recommend this brand of coffee. Anyway, he sodomized people all across the nation. Um, right. So I have a I have an idea if you wanted to. So I've uh, there's a, a substantial amount of bands that are named Panzram, uh, primarily in the punk and metal variety. Always okay. So there are many quotes from Panzram's book that are good. So I thought it'd be a fun game to play if we could do uh, Gigi Allen or Panzram. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. He prepped me for this. Yeah. Uh, 
And then we will go into uh, is the the idea where the book finally came from to wrap up here and think of your casting couch. Comes. Okay, so ready? Hit this me, is uh, Gigi Allen or Pan's Ram. For those who don't know Gigi Allen, um, he is uh, he. Your children already love him. <laughs> he is. Uh, He's a, a, a character of questionable ethics who definitely would not exist today. So ready for this quote? Hit me. This is Gigi Allen or Panzeran. Naturally, I now love Jesus very much. Yes, I love him so damn much that I would like to crucify him all over again. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go Gigi Allen on that one. I'm going to go Carl. Kahuna gets out. Carl Panzeran. No oh, shit. All right. <laughs> All right, okay. the stakes are higher now. All right, question number two. I want to get drunk and pass out on the floor. I want to cut my skin. I want to feel pain. It's the life I lead. Well, I know for a fact Gigi Allen did that in concert on a regular basis. GG. That is Gigi Allen. You're Oof. both right. Oof. Kahuna, yeah. Kahuna's still up by one. Still got me. Okay, last question. I will kill every man, woman, and child who gets in my way. <laughs> GG Carl. Allen. That's actually Hillary Clinton. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, damn it. <laughs> uh, well, returning guest, returning guest. <laughs> and that's why, baby. Oh, uh, he's the oh worst. God. I Oh, uh, man. All right. Good game, good game. <laughs> That's a solid game. Kuna won that one. I'll give him that. Yeah, he's up, yeah. Well, uh, now he's got to write his own biography, though, which some of those quotes are going to come from. And uh, it's interesting because he actually makes friends with one of his prison guards on death row. Uh, the guy's name was, let's see if I have it. I know it's Henry Lesser mm -hmm. was the name of the guard. So he befriends Panzram to a degree because he gives Panzram money to buy cigarettes. And no one had ever been nice to Carl before. It's Carl's a, heart grew three sizes that day. It's also Hello, important. Please. It's also important to understand that Henry Lesser was the Rudy of prison guards. He's five foot nothing, one hundred and forty pounds. Yes. So, like his uh, empathetic nature was probably due to that, you know. And that was the first love that I guess old Carl had seen in a bit. If you remember, too, I think it was in that documentary that you and I have both seen that he actually this is how, he, how much Panzram came to love uh, Henry Lesser, that he told him, he goes, hey, make sure you don't ever turn your back on me or get anywhere I can grab you. He goes, because I might just kill you and I don't want to because I like you. So that was the mm. that's how much rage he actually called himself rage personified, too. I should have said that earlier. Um, what, a great, he, what a great WWE name. Rage, rage personified. Yeah. Well, uh. He said, there's nothing in life better than bourbon and sodomy. Legit quote. I'll agree with half of that. That's it. Well, another quote when the uh, human rights activists were trying to uh, uh, you know, help him out a little bit, uh, he wrote back to them, the only thanks you and your kind will ever get from me for your efforts on my behalf is that I wish you all had one neck and that I could put my hands on it. Yeah, he, he would have had great shoot interviews. Oh, man, this would be... Uh, yeah. Like your boy from the West Memphis Three documentary, Damien Eccles. No, uh, uh, the other guy, the father. Oh, um, Mark Byers. Mark something Byers like. yeah. just died. R.I.P. Mark Byers, West Memphis, Arkansas. <laughs> What's up? Well, yeah. So now he actually allows uh, Lester's gonna. It starts with cigarettes, right? And then he winds up giving him a pen and paper, and then uh, all this shit starts coming out of Panzeram. He's telling his whole life. Some of it's bullshit. We can't prove a lot of this. We can't corroborate majority of his murders. But he definitely murdered that guy in the prison that got him the death sentence. So it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you got uh, we put away Capone, but we put him away for tax evasion instead of murder. Um, but uh, that's where that amazing quote to start his whole story off um, comes from with uh, the murder and the sodomy and admitting it. And I have no regret and all that other stuff. Panzram uh, is for his methods of execution. He does not get the electric chair, even though it's 1930. He's hung. OK. He's hung on September 5th, 1930, and uh, supposedly uh, he spit in his own executioner's face. Okay. What was his last meal? 
<laughs> Interesting. Uh -oh. I have this. No shit. Hit me. Okay, last meal, so, Carl Panzram. Um, he wanted. Okay, so uh, his last meal, uh, he attempted suicide previous to his execution by he took beans and hid them in his uh, cell and he ate a bunch of rotten beams and then severed an artery on his leg with a button from his shirt and he was revived Holy but shit. his last meal was actually rotten beans you can't make that up Good i don't know God. what they hope to add beans beans the magical fruit yeah. indeed i figured it was just a cup of fucking toenails or some shit <laughs> he's a wild boy man he sure is on no that milk one. no but yeah so i think that's carl panzram in a nutshell it is I, we got one last thing we okay. gotta hit though um so uh when i asked him what his last words were did you get this yes hurry up you who's your bastards i could kill a dozen men while you guys are screwing around <laughs> And his grave at uh, Fort Leavenworth uh, Penitentiary Cemetery is marked only with his prison number, 31614. So, huh. um, there was a movie made about him, okay? Um, and they had, uh, there's been a couple good documentaries and stuff like that. But I did want to mention um, that James Woods has already played him. Oh my God. Yeah, so James Woods played him. And uh, I'll ask you this question. Is that the same James Wood from Twitter? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, political activist James Wood. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but that being said, guys, as we're wrapping up here, um, Kahuna, if you're ready for it, and you got a, uh, you want to bounce one off, and Andy, if you got anybody else you can think of, okay. Too. Andy, if you want to, if you want to go first, man, go for it. Okay. I think I do feel like there's an element of uh, a very smart Forrest Gump here, like a murder Gump. Um, forest murder, something like that, you know? <laughs> so th if it wasn't Billy Bob, I would go, I think Tom Hanks could do the role. Wow. Tom Hanks. Ooh, yeah. that would be a Cause he doesn't play bad guys. Cause he's, he's never really played a bad guy. No, I don't think he has, but he has the potential to really inhabit a character. And I think this might be a, you know, if you did a double feature of him as Mr. Rogers juxtaposed against him as Carl Panzram, mm -hmm. I would watch that. I don't right, know. So the minute like you started painting the picture for this dude, I had like I started getting a mental image before I looked up the picture. And it was this guy, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mitch Pelegi from the X Files. He played Walter Skinner. Oh, Skinner that makes sense. Watch this. This dude. Yeah, no, I know oh, who he wow. is. Yeah. Yeah, I know this. Guy. He looks like uh, Bill Goldberg a little bit. If he like, I know he's a little, he's on the older side now because I know our boy didn't reach that age. But I feel like a few years prior, a little younger, this dude could have killed it. No, yeah, that makes sense. Tough looking dude, right uh, who's there. Who's that man? football guy who has that similar look? Was he just in Guardians of the Galaxy? Uh, no, no football. You and football. The, That's Batista. You're thinking I'm of thinking no. Batista. Um, football. What position? No, he's an announcer. Oh, announcer. Um, uh, probably, a, probably a previous player. This might be the part you have to cut out because I don't know the name of the football no guy. Sweat. No, it's we'll, all good. Figure yeah. it out. Um, good. I do like this uh, Mitch Pelegi guy, though, is him. And then uh, the Tom Hanks one, that's very interesting. Yeah. I personally think Carl Panzram could be played and should be played by a strong, independent woman of color. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> so that's why I'm going with Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I thought you were going to say Angela Bassett. And I, I was, was like, going oh, shit. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. <laughs> <laughs> if we um, had... Um, <laughs> yeah. If we had Zoe Saldana play, uh, it, it would be the first time I was ever sexually attracted to uh, Carl Pan's room. <laughs> that being said, we are going to wrap up because I got another guest coming in and a uh, high roller has to get back to court. Um, <laughs> so anything you want to say on your way out, brother? Thank you. You were a great guest as always. I hope it was fun for everybody. It was awesome it, sitting in with you this time, man. I know you had Ming first time. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was good too. I'm anxious. And he's got another topic because he's actually doing me a favor today with this episode. We have another topic that he picked that is... When I read some of this shit, I'm like, all right, I, how do I not know about this guy? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, we'll Andy is that. the, uh, I'm the Xanax to uh, Andy's Coke binge. You know what I mean? <laughs> we, we balance each other out pretty nicely. The yin and yang. Exactly. Cahoon, yeah. is anything else you want to say to the people at home? Uh, nah, man, I'm good. Uh, just support the Patreon if you can. It's only five bucks a month. Thank you get you. Uh, you get the bonus content. You get the one episode for free. And then... Uh, there's going to be a lot more stuff we're working on, too. We are I'm working on Kahuna's about. trying to coach me up. I'm a stubborn student, all right? Kahuna's a masterful teacher that way. Like he said, five bucks over on Patreon. At the end of every month, you do get a bonus episode. 
uh, that will be exclusive to that. I'm not putting those out on anything else. Check us out on Instagram, over on Facebook. Uh, if you do want to leave us a written review, that shit helps. It's always nice to read those, man. I am curious, though, about one of his aliases, though, Christian Cordes. I don't know. <laughs> that's, the, that's the best one. Yeah, like, that's like the most normal one out of all the bunch. I, was I don't like, know. That about, sounds suspicious to me. And yeah, by the way, it sounds really weird. If you follow me on Instagram, Andy underscore High Roller, I will... Uh... I will let you download the um, Patreon episodes for free. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just a simple click, not $5 a month. So Dick. hit me up. Uh, you do have to put it with a lot of photos of his feet, though, okay? So it's not going to go great for everybody. Uh, and just like that, you heard Tarantino shed a tear on the other <laughs> side of the country. But no, that was awesome. Andy, thank you so much for coming as a guest, brother. Have a good day, everybody. Oh, it was good. And uh, Cahoons, thank you as always. LP no will be back soon, guys, shortly. Thank you so much. My name was KP Burke, and that was Carl Panzram, American Loser. An American Loser the day I was born. An American Loser the day I was born. An American Loser the day I was born.